What up, player, profiler, faithful? It's Matty Kiboom. Welcome to the latest episode of The Game Plan. Everyone, please take a minute to like this video and subscribe to the Player Profiler YouTube channel if you are not already. Ladies and gents, today's episode is going to be nothing short of awesome because I am joined by an absolute legend and we're answering some of the hardest roster questions as we approach training camp season. So gang, get out your pens and your pads and let's start game planning to dominate our drafts. Planners, today I am joined by a very incredibly special guest. He is the managing editor at Fantasy Pros and Betting Pros. I am so excited for this conversation because I have been a fan of this guest for a very long time, and I have referred to his rankings for some of the toughest fantasy decisions that I've had to make throughout the years. Last year, he finished 20 out of 247 total rankers in the Fantasy Pro Rankings uh, contest. So it's a good thing that I've been re relying on his rankings because the man is pretty dang good at it, but it's okay. I'm very excited. For, like I said, I'm very excited for this episode. And I am talking about, of course, the legend. Gang, please allow me to welcome the great Pat Fitzmaurice. What's going on, Pat? Maddie, thank you. Uh, what an introduction, man. You are way too generous and kind. Uh, but thanks, man. Uh, and, you know, as we were talking about beforehand, I am uh, about to be a lacrosse dad all day. My, my <laughs> daughter's got a tournament. Um, you know, she's in the summer league. They've got a bunch of tournaments stacked up, and uh, yeah, so like I'm going to be treated to a girls lacrosse triple header today, but it's nice to squeeze in a little bit of football with you before I have to go. You got to get your dose of football. It's going to it's gonna quench that thirst for the rest of the day, and then you're like full lacrosse dad mode. Everything's good to go. I was going to try to throw some terms out there, but the fact is I don't really know a whole lot about lacrosse, so I was don't, what are some of the terms? Is it checking? Is that still considered checking like they do in hockey? Yeah, I think they call it check. They still call it checking. Um, there's this this thing where, um, you know, if there's a penalty and uh, the fouled player gets sort of a, a free shot to come in on goal and try to score, that's called like free space. But uh, I'm pretty new to all this too, Matty. My, both of my kids started playing like two years ago. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the good thing. Like if, if I'm at these games, uh, officials are making calls and I have no idea whether it's the right or the wrong call. Like I'm not complaining about things like you know or yeah I, I was never a real boisterous like yell at the ump kind of sports dad but like you know I would definitely mutter under my breath at a few of the calls in baseball or basketball I went against my kids uh lacrosse I just have no idea so I'm just assuming the officials are right <laughs> it's one of those it, is, was that it, it was bad Dad, what are you doing you had to double <laughs> exactly hey, yes yes I have a I bring I brought someone here he's, a, he's what I call my confirmer he confirms that I can go crazy <laughs> that was bad. That was a bad call, right? All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But Pat, thank you so much. I'm I'm so glad you wanted to squeeze in some football talk before your long day of lacrosse. We are going to be dissecting some rosters today, talking about some of the toughest decisions in terms of how to evaluate certain receiver rooms, uh, running back situations, things of that nature. Because training camp is right around the corner, and pretty soon we're going to get some of these answers with what we see on those practice fields. But we're going to get a head start, and everyone listening today is going to appreciate this head start where we're dissecting these rosters. But, Pat, before we get into that, I like to surprise the guests in the game plan with a couple of questions. These are questions that are on the show sheet because I love to get that true answer from the top of your head. So question number one is how long have you been playing fantasy football? And then the follow-up is how would you describe your management style? Oh, man, uh, I'm going to date myself here, Maddie. I've been playing since the early 90s and, uh, you know, like college. Um Buddy got me into it, uh, you know, and I, I remember being initially very like, um, I don't know, kind of almost aghast at the idea of fantasy football because I'd played fantasy baseball and fantasy mm -hmm. baseball had a way to like sort of incorporate your, your hitters, your pitchers. It took everyone into account. I'm like, how can you do fantasy football? Like, it, you know, how do you right. score for offensive linemen and defensive linemen? <laughs> and wait, what? It's just the, the receivers and running backs and quarterbacks like that's that's lame. <laughs> and um but yeah man like i i drafted this terrible team in a league where it was just basically winner takes all every week i think everyone put in really? like five, five bucks a week in college okay. and uh you know like 10 guys so the winner got 50 bucks every week and uh i hated my team it sucked and then like i won <laughs> um 
I won like the week before Thanksgiving or something. I like I finally broke what through. A week this great to win. Week. Yeah, exactly. Fifty bucks in my pocket for you know yeah. going home for Thanksgiving and you know, seeing all my high school buddies at the bars. It was perfect. Like that kind of got me hooked. <laughs> that one winning experience and um, my management style. I mean, I hate to admit it, Maddie, but it's like passive now. And it's okay. like I I don't manage it as aggressively as I used to because I've got so many damn teams because I work in the industry and, you know, everyone wants you to be in a league and I'm in like yes. 35 leagues. And it's, you know, <laughs> it's hard to like micromanage every team the way I used to do when I had one or two teams. Do you still have one league that just is like the home league or or one of your favorites with a bunch of the guys that's been doing it for a long time in this league? Do you have do you still have that one league that just matters more than the rest? I do. There's one that's been uh, going since the 1990s. It's it's not like a keeper. It's redraft every year, but it's a 16 teamer, and we oh, have nice. like a, yeah, and we have like a 22 round draft. So it it is a monster of an endeavor. And uh, yeah, that one definitely <laughs> matters a little more than uh, some of the yeah. others. We had a my, we had our lottery last night. So we're one of those leagues that you know everyone's gotten so. F- advanced with their gaming when it comes to fantasy football so you know rookie drafts are probably 90 percent completed across a lot of these dynasty leagues but you know we're a dinosaur league we've been around for a long long time same group of guys and we draft the sunday before labor day we did that the first week i mean the first year i think it was 12 years ago and that's the game plan so we did our lottery last night but it's fun to get in those leagues because you know you're in the industry so you're thinking about fantasy you're breaking down fantasy so much but it's nice to get it with like your guys that you could just kind of you know shoot the breeze with about fantasy it's like it's like oh takes you back to when that's all it was when it was just a game it wasn't so much like now it's like i got i got all these charts like i know what week seven correlation is week seven decorrelation all this stuff i know this these terms now but yeah the home leagues are always so much fun is is that home league a live draft for you man oh yeah live draft yeah. every year yeah so that's the that's thing fun. we this this 16 teamer like we the live draft is sacred to us because this is like the only time a lot of us see each other every year yep so but like we can't do it on labor day because everyone's got family stuff going on mm-hmm. and like a bunch of guys are really reluctant to do it earlier than labor day so what we actually did like our solution because in the past we'd always drafted like the day before the first sunday of the nfl season right then they introduced the thursday game and it's like oh man what are we going to do now (laughs) we just we still draft the day before the first sunday we just make uh the stats from the thursday night game retroactive so that actually affects where people draft guys who played in that game Um, right you know and it's like a lot of people think that's friggin' crazy and a stupid way to do it but like we cherish the live draft we've got some other obstacles to doing it earlier what the hell man i mean this is our solution exactly and when you're in those leagues it it doesn't matter when you're when you're playing in those leagues that the adp that skyrockets from the you know wide receiver three on the lions or whatever this year they're playing the thursday night game it's it's worth it as long as the boys can get together exactly. hang out and do the live draft because the live draft sacred. So, but that, that's awesome. Uh, uh, that's that's awesome to talk to you about that. We've had a lot of guests, uh, which I was surprised of. To, they they kind of would describe their style more aggressive. I would assume people would be more like you know let the values come to you, let the leagues play out. But no, a lot of people are like I like to get after it. So it's nice to hear a different <laughs> point of view, especially someone who has been doing it as long as you have. Uh, but let's get into the, the the first roster here that we're going to break down. But before we do, let's hear from the pod father as he talks about rival fantasy. Oh, baseball season's heating up. It's all about baseball right now. You know, eh, baseball, baseball. Yeah, baseball is the most exploitable of the sports, especially on Rival Fantasy, rivalfantasy.com. Go there now. They have the fantasy book where you can take over under a certain number of fantasy points, and they have challenges where you can take player X or player Y. I get great pleasure out of fading Mike Trout into oblivion. And then don't forget about fantasy bingo, where you can say, okay, I think Acuna's going to steal a base today. I think that Freddie Freeman's going to have two hits based on the matchup. The lefty-righty and the pitcher quality matchups that you could exploit are unlike any other sport. Go to RivalFantasy.com. Use the promo code PLAYER. They refund any losses up to 50 bucks, and they are a great supporter of Player Profiler. Everything we do, this show in particular, is only possible because of Rival. RivalFantasy.com. The promo code is PLAYER. 
Use that promo code player at Rival Fantasy. And if you had been watching this promo since we started it a few months ago and just keep betting on Ronald Acuna's stolen bags, you would probably have a nice little win pot because my man has been stealing a ton of bags. First situation, Pat, I'd love to talk to you about is the Chiefs wide receiver room. So first question here, what are your expectations for Tony, for Rice, MVS, the whole group? How do you see this kind of playing out? I mean, collectively for the group, they're kind of modest if if uh, Travis Kelsey stays healthy all season. I mean, you right. know, we saw last year really, um, you know, a lot of people were interested in fishing in that pond with Tyreek Hill not being there anymore. And, uh, you know, the, the pond was not well stocked. There was just not a lot of <laughs> fantasy goodness in that wide receiver core last year. Um, but like, I'm kind of excited about Kadarius Tony and what mm. he could potentially do. And it's, um, you know, with him, it's mainly, and I've like recited this stat on, uh, you know, a bunch of fantasy pros shows. So, uh, people might've heard this before, but this guy in his two years, although he's played kind of a limited snap count because of all the injuries. And obviously the injuries are sort of baked into his price right now. He's getting faded. Um, he has earned a snap on 17.3% of his or earned a target on 17.3% of his snaps mm -hmm. across two years. And just to put that into perspective, I mean, Justin Jefferson, who was the target leader last year, earned a target on 17.1% of his snaps. So like Tony's in the game, he's getting targeted. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he's going to play a 90% snap share. Probably not. Like he's probably going to be, um, you know, rotated in and out. Uh, but still, like, boy, if this dude can stay healthy, and I know that's a big if because he's mm -hmm. injured basically every body part in uh, two years in the league. <laughs> but man, if <laughs> just if the, the full dude, body cask, Tony, pretty much, man. I mean, the, the guy got COVID twice in one season, <laughs> not once, but twice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, yeah, the guy's kind of a train wreck as far as health, but he is healthy as of now. Like he's mm -hmm. not coming off any sort of major injury. So I'm most excited about him. And then like, you know, I'm not doing the MVS thing again. I feel like, uh, you know, right. Richie James is just like, you know, if Kadarius Tony is hurt all year, then maybe Richie James pops, but otherwise no. Um, you know, like Sky Moore, I could maybe buy the idea of a, a second year breakout. You know, mm -hmm. he was coming from the Mac conference and I know we're now getting used to wide receivers popping as rookies. But it used to be that like rookie receivers were considered a bad investment. Don't get them until their second or third year. Maybe that's the path we see more take. Uh, mm -hmm. Rice, I I'm probably not going to have too much of Rasheed Rice. I thought he was kind of a one-year wonder. Not necessarily a total one-year wonder in college, but only one really big year at a pass-happy uh, spread offense school at SMU. Mm -hmm. And uh, who's the other guy? Oh, uh, Ross, Justin Ross. Yeah, really yeah, interesting, fine. interesting late round dart throw. I mean, he would have been a, a pretty prized receiver prospect if not for what the, the neck or spinal issues. Yes. Yep. I mean, if he gets neck, a yeah. very interesting, if he gets a clean bill of health and is OK in training camp in the preseason. Ross, I mean, so far, and I got to give him a lot of credit for this, the basketball shorts catches so far are fantastic him and Patrick Bones have two or three videos that's kind of gone through the ranks of him making some really nice catches but of course it's the you know basketball short season it's not in the game uh Tony sounds like he's your favorite so is he the receiver that you want most at cost right now I think so just yeah. they're all cheap but Tony is pretty cheap I mean he's going typically mm -hmm. like somewhere in the wide receiver 35 to wide receiver 40 range mm -hmm. and yeah. like if I can get him as my fourth or fifth wide receiver and, you know, like if he is hurt all year, whatever, it's, it's, you mm -hmm. know, not that big a deal. I'm, I'm not going to get burned for, for having wasted that pick, but like, I think the potential payoff is pretty sweet. Yeah. He's going after, you know, the Michael Pittman juniors, the DJ Moore's the guys who do have the damn near hundred percent route participation rates, but that, like you said, it's built into the cost and what, let's just say in a world where he stays healthy, what do you think his ceiling is for Kadarius Tony? I mean, the skill set is tantalizing. The offense is obviously a dream. So, what is his true ceiling if he stays healthy? Man, even without that ninety percent snap share, even if he was at like at sixty five, mm -hmm. with the rate at which he draws targets, I could see like you know eighty five catches, eleven hundred yards, eleven touchdowns. Like that's right. the and probably some rushing yardage too. 
So, um, yeah, right. They use, you know, they do the, they like those type of formations and those play calls with these guys, whether it be Sky Moore, uh, or even Ricky Jerry Stone. We saw it in the Super Bowl, even that they, they use this type of jet. Yep. Sometimes they pass, sometimes they run. And, you know, Kadarius Tony has that four four three speed. And remember, when he came out of Florida, the expectation was, well, this is obviously Urban Meyer, so you could take it with a grain of salt. But his idea was he was going to take Tony if he was there. I think it was like twenty three. They he went one he went one twenty. So he went to, in the first round to the Giants, and he was going to use him like uh, Etn kind of. He his he envisioned Kadarius Tony being this kind of gadget player plus where he could make some plays out of the backfield. He could, you know, run the ball a couple times. He'd obviously be a weapon in the passing game. And we always will have that game in Dallas, right, Pat? Yes. Oh, my God. Then that was just such a, a great illustration of, like, his springy athleticism. Oh. Like, I watch him play, and, I like, springy is always the word that pops into my mind because the guy is, like, a coiled spring. Mm-hmm. And, man, when he, like, decides he wants to change direction, like, Defenders just can't keep up. It happens too fast for them to, you know, track him. They just, you cannot mirror that guy in single coverage. It's crazy. He does have this ability, Pat, that when he's running his routes or trying to juke someone out of their shoes, it looks like he almost has the force in him. And he's just kind of like, you go that (laughs) way. I'm going this way. Yes, exactly. For those who may not remember, and if you play fantasy football, you certainly do. This is a 2021 game when he was still in the New York Giants against the Dallas Cowboys. He saw 13 targets. He got 10 of them for 189 yards. So when you put up a damn near 30-point fantasy day and you don't score a touchdown, it's tantalizing. It's reminiscent of the old, you know, the prime Antonio Brown days. I still feel like those type of games, it just takes one. And we're just we're kind of hooked. So uh, I, I'm definitely I'm with you on Tony. I also like Tony for the sneaky stacking ability. If you are able, you know, in your best ball drafts, getting Mahomes, you don't have to double tap the position if you miss out. You know, the, everyone's dreaming for the Kelsey Pat Mahomes stack, obviously. But the Tony stack, you can wait a little bit later. Like you said, wide receiver 35, how that goes. Maybe get a little aggressive to make it happen. So I, I'm with you there. I'm definitely at least going after Tony amongst the wide receivers here. I do have. It's a gut feeling. It's a little gut feeling about Richie James that if he does take a lot of the slot snaps, if he does become part of this offense in the slot, he can truly dominate. He was one of only four receivers last year, Pat, to have a 45 or better route win rate and score 6.5 or more fantasy points from the slot. The other three was Godwin, Lamb, and Amon Ross St. Brown. So whether it was just circumstance or not or skill set, James feels like someone who's having this late resurgence in his career. And I just I feel like that and something in my gut tells you that. But the truth is with Kelsey there, and if Tony does stay on the field and he pops, it's gonna be tough for James to get a whole lot of play there. It it does feel like he's um in this group with like Greg Dorch and Braxton Berrios, where like these guys are good, yeah. but they're they're plan B. Yeah. Like that's kind of the thing. Like if, if plan A goes awry, these guys are here for you, but like you almost are reluctant to draft the plan B guys because you know something has to happen first before they can pop. Right. Something bad's going to happen to one of the players on the field or something. And it's just, it's tough to game plan the injuries. So we're, we're both in on on Tony at cost. Which of these players are you fading at their current value? Um, well, MVS for sure. Just like, you know, I'm a Packers fan, Maddie. I've seen it before. (laughs) Like I I know how the story turns out. (laughs) Like, you know, he's going to, he's going to make a couple of long catches probably, but like, it's just not going to be anything you can, especially in a managed league where you Mm -hmm. have to like start it Like, when do you start Mark Marquez Valdez Scantling? There's just like no good time. You never feel comfortable doing it. And then I guess Rasheed Rice, like, uh, unless, Mm -hmm. The buzz is so great. And and don't you feel like, Maddie? generally, like this is going to be a situation that's really sensitive to any training camp hype? Like if oh. we hear that Sky Moore is catching everything in sight, mm-hmm. like Sky Moore's ADP is what, like 12th or 13th round? But like if, if that comes out, I could see someone sitting on the clock in like a best ball draft taking him. Oh, I'll just take him with this ninth round pick. Pat, you are so true. And I I think that's a piece of advice that some of the listeners can take away from this conversation is certain teams, and the Chiefs are absolutely one of them, you have to be proactive and you have to stick to your laurels. You stick to your process and what you're saying yourself now, you know, try to keep that as your base level expectation because all of a sudden Patrick Mahomes, like you said, has a couple of tapes that hit Twitter with Sky Moore 
his ADP will go up. It's we want the players on these tantalizing offenses, and the hype and the the drum beat and all of that is driven. It's it's so volatile throughout a whole training camp season, and then obviously with content getting it the way it is where you know there's so much of it out there with so many people diving in on twitter or or doing their shows that there's more videos than there ever was there's more hype behind every single thing than there ever was and it can just take off it can absolutely take off so i i think for me when it comes to this wide receiver room i'm in on tony because i just they don't have a true number two after Kelsey. And if it is Tony, we talked about the skill set. We talked about the possibility and how versatile he could be in this offense. That I, I think that I'm willing to go with that as my pick. And the, the last thing I want to ask you about, Tony, is if Kelsey does get hurt, are we looking at a top 12, 15 receiver on every given week? Is, is his upside without Kelsey around just through the roof? Or do you think they would be kind of dispersed and, and be more like – uh, without Kelsey, kind of nothing gets better. Yeah, I mean, I still think that with um, the likelihood that he does not play a totally full snap share, like maybe that, like that sort of limits the ceiling a little bit. I mean, I mentioned that possibility of an eleven hundred yard, eleven touchdown season, and obviously we're talking about like a top five percent. Oh yeah, we're yeah, we're, this so, is lofty. Yeah, and I mean, I, I do think a Kelsey injury would certainly increase the probability of us hitting that outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I, I think a Kelsey injury would not only, you know, boost Tony. I mean, I think that could really open the door for one or two of these other guys, too. I, I mean, that would be, you know, if you were a Sky Moore investor, I, I think you'd have to be excited about the possibilities of that. And uh, mm-hmm. man, it would it would be interesting to see Noah Gray all of a sudden become the hot waiver wire property for uh, that week's action. If uh, you know <laughs> Noah Gray isn't even rostered in a lot of like you know twenty eight thirty spot dynasty leagues, and uh, I think everyone would be jumping all over that guy if. if Kelsey got hurt. I mean, he would be a fab breaker. It, it, he yeah. would just absolutely destroy if he would. And he's flashed. And the thing about the Chiefs. Yeah. If you can remember a few months ago, a lot of mock drafts had them going after Mayer or going after Kincaid, grabbing one of these stud tight ends. And they're like, no, we're good with Gray. We're, we, we're good with Fortson. We're good with the tight ends that we have yeah. after Kelsey. So I think that does speak to a little uh, excitement if, if he were to go down. I just, my one concern if something were to happen to like a Travis Kelsey is he's such a monumental piece in how they do things. I wonder if like the whole machine kind of has to either adapt or die to a point where it's just not realistic for us fantasy gamers to truly, to like, you know, really benefit from if you roster, you know, the, the, the Sky Moors. Uh, I do think someone is going to have to be the alpha and we're on the same page that we believe it would be Tony. So I, I, fingers crossed it won't happen. I want Kelsey to play all season long, but we're just game planning. It's the name of the show. We got to get ready for all the scenarios. So that's going to be the Chiefs br- breakdown for the wide receivers. Go for Tony. Fade MVS. You don't need that kind of stress in your life. Take it from a Packers fan. You don't need that stress <laughs> in your life. Exactly. The next wide receiver room that we're going to talk about is the Broncos. May, I would say it's probably more exciting. I think there's a little bit more from that pack, uh, Broncos wide receiver room than the Chiefs. So what are your expectations for Sutton, Judy, rookie Marvin Mims, the accountant Tim Patrick, even K.J. Hamler even? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, Maddie, with the, the Broncos, like, well, with the Chiefs, you've got Patrick Mahomes as the constant, you know, this, this metronome of, like, mm-hmm. high-level passing productivity. So – um, you can sort of count on that and, you know, work out your projections and guesses as to who's going to pop mm-hmm. among the pass catchers based on that. We can't quite be sure about that with Russ. I mean, because we <laughs> saw some pretty major slippage from Russ last year. Um, he was starting to get back on the rails late mm-hmm. in the season. But I do have some questions about, you know, Russ's future going forward after what we saw last year. And I know that Sean McVay, like if anyone can get him back on track, it's McVay. But I don't know, Maddie. I, I watched, um, you know, I'm a, a Wisconsin graduate. And yep, so I watched, you know, day, yeah. yeah, so we had that great year from Russ there. Um, you know, I loved seeing him succeed to the extent that he did in Seattle. Mm-hmm. But I just worry if... I worry that the secret sauce for Russ is his escapability. And, um, you know, especially when guys were like bearing down on him from the edge, he would like Mm -hmm. 
I have this magical little spin move he always used to do to get outside like the rush when I was trying to hem him in. And then all of a sudden he's on the run with no one around him and his receivers are getting all this extra time to get open. And that's when Russ was like at his most dangerous. And I have not right. seen that same sort of escapability from him the last couple of seasons. So I'm worried without that, he's kind of just a guy, like just an average NFL quarterback. Um, yeah, I mean, last year we saw his completion percentage tank, you know, you know, right around sixty percent. So, can he, are you a little nervous then, so that he he may not bounce back? A little bit, a little yeah. bit, and it it makes me. So I'm maybe a little below consensus on some of the Denver receivers just okay. because of right. that, and because there are a bunch of good ones, you know, like yeah. um, yeah. I mean, Judy. Judy, I think, is just really good at running routes and getting open, and he's good after the catch. Like, he's got two ways that he can beat you, the route running and the 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 after-the-catch ability. Mm -hmm. So, like, if Russ is good and this passing offense is is solid, I think Judy's going to have a good year. And I actually think Sutton is pretty good, too. I mean, we've seen Mm -hmm. him win before as, like, a downfield receiver and, like, you know, pretty good at high-pointing the ball and and bringing in those longer throws. Um, But, you know, after he – there was a lot of hype for him in August last year. He didn't live up to it. So now you're getting kind of an attractive discount. You can get him as like your fifth receiver. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like Tim Patrick, who everyone just like never wants to really think about. Uh, Meanwhile, he's like going to Denver Nuggets playoffs, playoff games with Russ. Mm -hmm. Like they're talking about him being like Russ's favorite target. I mean, we should maybe start talking, taking that talk seriously Right. Like that this guy is going to come back from an injury and once again be like a pretty substantial part of this passing game. So for that reason, I can't really get into Marvin Mims, uh, even though I think he's a, a decent prospect. I just I don't know if there's room for him to pop in year one. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, K.J. Hamler, too, um, you know, super fast and slippery. But I just uh, like I don't know how he gets traction barring like multiple injuries. KJ Hamler was probably my one of my favorite. Well, he was definitely one of my favorite sleepers last year. I, I, but he didn't fire. He got hurt again. They brought in uh, another receiver, Tim Patrick. Did. I think KJ Hamler's kind of his chance at being fantasy relevant is probably on the outs. Uh, but Tim Patrick, you bring him up. He's coming basically free. His ADP right now is outside of the top 280. I mean, you're getting him at the very end if you have a deep draft. And it's not, we're not that far removed from back to back 700 yard season. So, you know, I know your colleague, D Bro, Derek Brown, he's very much in on Cortland Sutton this year. Uh, so, if you're in on Sutton, Sutton had what, 826 receiving yards last year. He was in the 820s, I want to say. So, if we, if you think that that's something to build off of, I mean, Tim Patrick, the, you know, back to back 700 yard season, seasons is pretty good. So, uh, Judy definitely has the highest ceiling. But of amongst all of these guys, which ones do you want at their current value? Boy, really, Patrick. I mean, it, like, mm, just because he's so late. Yeah, if I... Um, Pat, I like it. And and that's the thing. Like, I'm probably, you know, a, a smidge below consensus on both Judy and Sutton. So I'm probably not getting those guys. Someone's always going to like him in drafts more than I will. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so, like, Patrick might be a guy. If, if I don't have one of those guys rostered, Patrick is around in the late rounds. Like, I'm, I'm grabbing him, man. I oh, just, yeah. like... Yeah, and and then like if if anything happened to Judy or Sutton, I know it it's funny, man. Doesn't it seem to you like last year people perceived this big gap between Sutton and Judy? Like everyone was in on Sutton last year, mm-hmm. yeah. And now everyone like there's this big gap, and everyone's in on Judy this year. But oh, I feel gap. like in reality the gap is maybe not like I'd rather have Judy. I think he's better, but I don't think it's as big a gap as the ADP suggests. I, I, I kind of agree. Judy's going in a range that I just don't ever really get much shares of Judy, whether it be best ball or any of the redraft or, you know, the, the startups I've been in this year, because he's going just in a range with other players that I'm just, I'm attacking those players. I just like those players more. And then when Sutton comes up, I, I, it's, I, that's the one that I kind of want at cost. He's going in the range sometimes of like Jaden Reed and, and these these guys who I like, but I still believe that Sutton can can fire. And it's something about the fit, right, Pat, with these receivers that you can see a world that if Russ does cook, and I'm sorry for the term, everyone's played out Russ cook. It's It's been beaten to death. But let's say he is Mr. Unlimited. He goes nuclear this year. Sean Payton brings that out in him. 
Judy can succeed because of how he attacks the football field. Sutton can succeed because he's your contested catch guy. And it almost feels like one of Mims or Patrick can maybe get a little bit. But then when you factor in the tight ends, it kind of gets a little bit more murky. But Mims and Patrick seem like one-for-one type role fillers, or, or should I say depth pieces that can slide right into those roles if something were to happen to Judy or Sutton. It feels like Patrick would just go right into that role. Judy would just be Mims could go help with Judy was where they kind of have that same similar skill set. So I'm not really out on any of these receivers at their current cause. Are there any that you're fading? You're just not uh, going in, going after at all. I mean, I guess like I've, I picked up Mims in a couple of dynasty rookie drafts, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm feeling good about his future. I'm just not feeling great about his 2023. It's just hard for yeah, me to yeah. envision him carving out a big enough target share to, to be fantasy relevant. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense this year. It's just, man, I, has Russ ever just been like so prolific to carry a bunch of them? Like I remember even in his heyday, Doug Baldwin was very good, but then after that it was, you know, sometimes it was curse. Uh, who else was in there? Then Lockett, obviously. But even Lockett took a few years to really become that guy. So I don't know if he can support three. So I'm I'm okay with Judy. I'm okay with Sutton. Mims in rookie drafts, that's a totally different story. You can want Mims there. He's got the 4-3-8 speed, the draft capital. He was Sean Payton's first ever draft selection with the Denver Broncos. So there is going to be a little bit of uh, additional value built into the confidence that the coaches have for him. But for this year... I haven't been pulling the trigger on a whole lot of Marvin Mims because I, 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 I'm with you. I think I need – I think there would have to be an injury to somebody to make that happen. How much – I want to ask you about Sutton here. How much value – and it's coach speak and it's coach speak season, so it might be none at all. But how much are you putting into the thoughts that Sutton's playing this Michael Thomas-esque role in the Sean Payton offense? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I just – like not a lot. Because I don't think yeah. he's, I don't think he can <laughs> be <not> that. Not, <laughs> yeah, I mean Michael Thomas's target counts were just so stupidly high, mm, uh, right? Those right. those years, and like I I don't see Sutton getting there with uh, Judy around. You know, like yeah, Judy's and, just better at getting open. I think. And Michael Thomas was called Slant Boy for a reason. You know, he just right, up. right. That doesn't seem like Colton Sutton's game. That doesn't seem like even when he was dominating SMU. That's not was his. That wasn't his game. His game was over the top. It's always been give me the ball. I'm going to catch it. You're not type of game playing. I don't see it. I don't put any value in it. But it is fun if you're trying to sell Court and Sutton and Dynasty. Tell your tell one of your league mates. Hey, you know, let me tell you a little Sutton. Sutton. He is running that Michael Thomas route tree. A lot of slants I heard for Sean Payton there. So yeah, and it's drive that value. <laughs> it'll be interesting to see if like uh, Payton tries to turn. Russell Wilson into more of a Drew Brees style quarterback because other than lack of size, those two don't really have much in common as far as their games. But no, you know, maybe no. uh, if we see Russ's average depth of target come way down and he's uh, checking down far more often and just right. unloading it really quickly the way Brees used to do. I mean, maybe, but like it just seems like that sort of game plan would benefit Judy more than Sutton. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It would, it would certainly benefit the running backs. If he's going to become Drew Brees, yeah. Drew Brees always checked down those running backs. We love that. That's why Pierre Thomas stuck around for a whole long time in, in New Orleans. Uh, last question about this, this, this passing hierarchy. How much can the tight ends really cut into the target shares? Should we be a little bit worried when we're trying to differentiate if Mims or Patrick is worth drafting? Will the tight ends be the, the three, number three pass catcher on the team? I love that you say tight ends, Matty, because I'm like this Albert O. Truther, and like still, keeping it, I'm still keeping a candle in the window, hoping that uh, Albert O. eventually shines. But uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's it's close to uh, the candle's pretty close to going out. I will say, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, good question. I mean, I, I like Greg Dulcich as a player, mm-hmm. and I've been really close to pulling the trigger on him in a bunch of best ball drafts, and then. I always think about the Denver receivers soaking up too big a target share. Uh, You know, basically what we just talked about, like, is there really enough for uh, Sutton, Judy, Patrick, Mims, like all these guys. And and then I get cold feet on Dulcich. So like, I, I, I think the most likely outcome for him is probably like mid range tight end two numbers this Mm -hmm. year. Um, I, I think there could be more and like in a different offense, I think he does have tight end one upside, but I just don't know if he gets a big enough target share this year. Dolchich again, he's not someone that I'm really targeting. I just, 
I don't know if he has that skill set to command the targets. You know what I mean? I think that Sutton will command targets. His route running ability is really, really strong. His, you know, he's going to be a quarterback's best friend. Judy, if he's going to be, you know, the contested catch guy, that makes a whole lot of sense in helping out the quarterback. Where Dulcich, I feel like he has to be a product of a prolific offense to truly shine, or like tight ends I always are, if he catches a bunch of touchdowns. That's kind of what we're at with Dulcich. A guy like Albert O, listen, Pat, you have a friend here. <laughs> I will always hold the candle for Albert O. 6'6, 260, 449 speed, 100th percentile speed score at playerprofiler.com. This is a type of guy that I feel like could command a little bit. This athlete, he's a freak athlete. But it seems like he has been buried. It seems like the candle is almost out. If any, uh, any of our listeners watch uh, Encanto, have children, they watch the movie Encanto. His candle is very close to going out in Casita. It's going to be tough uh, for Alberto. But, uh, you know, we can we can hope, right, Pat? We can hope. I know, man. I, I have a bunch of friends who went to the University of Missouri. So I, mm -hmm. you know, always kind of keep an eye on Missouri football. And the first time I ever saw Albert O, I was like, holy crap, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I'm just like, oh, my God, this guy's going to be amazing when he gets to the NFL. And I, I'm still just like still got that flicker of hope that it eventually happens. He's still young, Maddie. He, right. He's still young. And there was that one. Uh, the truthers like you and I, Pat, they, we have this one article we can always run to. What was the interim head coach last year? I can't remember his name. Uh, sorry, the interim coach of the Denver Broncos. Do you remember off the top of your head? Oh, name? God, after they fired Hackett, I can't even. I'm, I'm right. I, it was like, it was like, yeah, I can't remember who it was, but he was like, hey, this Albert O guy is pretty, uh, pretty athletic, huh? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Exactly. No kidding. It's like the reports that are surfacing right now that the, the Washington commanders are like, hey. Did you guys know that uh, you know Antonio Gibson was, was a receiver in college? And we're like, yeah, Riverboat Ron. We've known this. We want him to do that. Yeah, don't get me started on that one, man. Like I'm <laughs> such a pro Antonio Gibson guy, and it's like you know you hear Rivera saying all this. It's like, oh, you you realize he's on the roster now. Nice. Where was this last year when I had him on thirty teams? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, but speaking of running backs, we're going to talk about a, a very specific running back situation. It's We'll dive right into it. It's Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. So what do you expect that split to look like, first and foremost? Oh, man. Uh, you mentioned my colleague, Derek Brown, earlier. And, uh, I, like, we are on polar opposite ends. of. I, I think he sees something, like, close to a 50-50. And I think, like, I don't know, uh, de depending on which source you use, uh, you know, Najee's snap share last year with, was either, like, 66% or 65%. And, mm -hmm. um like, I think it's going to be the same, basically. Two-thirds Najee, one-third Jalen Warren. Oh, man, Pat, I wish I – sorry, D-Bro. I was, I was – you know, I can't take your side here because I'm with Pat. I, The Steelers historically don't run a committee. Last year with, you know, the Liz Frank injury to Najee Harris, the split was 65-35. The opportunity share was 70% in favor of Najee Harris, where the opportunity share for Jalen Warren was only 25%. Yeah, he had multiple double-digit games, and I do believe, and then my next question, we'll, we'll talk about the handcuff status, I do believe that Jalen Warren is the handcuff. He is the premier handcuff in fantasy football. But I don't see a 50-50 split. Najee Harris has the round one draft capital. He's been a producer for this team. Even last year, he was a 1,000-yard rusher with a Liz Frank injury. He did do his best for this football club, and Mike Tomlin just has not really been the committee guy. He really has kind of gone, he dated back to Rashad Mendenhall and those guys where it was, you know, Le'Veon Bell gets hurt, it's just D'Angelo Williams. We're going to just go with our guy regardless if it's backup or not. So I'm with you. I think Najee Harris, it's his backfield, and I do think he's a value. Do you think Najee Harris is a value because the community is kind of dragging his price down a little bit? Yes, I love the dip. I'm buying the dip. And I was kind of mm -hmm. out on him last year, Maddie, but like now I'm very much in on him because of the reduced price. And you mentioned the list, Frank, thing. Um, first eight games of last season, Najee averaged 59.1 yards from scrimmage a game. Last nine games, 87.8 yards from scrimmage, almost mm -hmm. 30 yards more. Like I know Najee himself has downplayed the impact of that list, Frank injury. Mm -hmm. I think that's just, you know, a guy playing for Mike Tomlin being a, a tough guy, a tough but guy, like yeah. clearly it was limiting him. Also, Maddie, like this is going to be the best offensive line he's ever run behind. Like the right. Steelers it's offensive good, line has good. not been good the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Like two years ago it was really bad and Najee succeeded in spite of it. 
last mm-hmm. year, you know, they kind of started the rebuilding project, but I'd still say it was like no better than average to slightly below average. Now they've signed uh, Nate Herbig and Isaac uh, Seumalu, if, if that's how you pronounce it. And um, they drafted Broderick Jones in the first right. round. Right. So uh, like they've infused a lot of talent on this offensive line. And like everyone gets excited about small sample efficiency. And I think that's kind of the case with Jalen Warren. Yeah. Oh, he averaged 4.9 yards per carry. Najee was at what? 3.9, a yard more per carry. Like, but that right. doesn't mean Jalen Warren's better, man. And I've, I've used the comp of like major league baseball pitchers where if you're the starter, you got to pace yourself, man, you're throwing a hundred pitches and uh, going seven innings and, and you can't be unleashing like your most wicked throws on every pitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas like, the, the one inning reliever can come in and pump hundred mile an hour fastballs. Like he doesn't oh, have to yeah. pace himself. Right. So, That's good, good analogy. I like that. Yeah. I, I mean, just a few years ago, remember the whole free Kenyon Drake thing? Like <laughs> Kenyon Drake was like a committee back, but he was like, his efficiency was off the charts. Yeah. And then he gets traded to the Cardinals. They make him a lead back and like the efficiency kind of disappears. I know he did have like 10 touchdowns in his one season as the Cardinals starter, but like he just wasn't, he, he didn't look, as special anymore and no, he got the ball soon at, yeah that soon that after that he was just like you know a, a <laughs> bottom of the committee back yes so, i mean right. like yeah, I, right. I just feel like we're getting some people are a little too enthusiastic about jalen warren when i don't think like Najee's role is changing at all i agree i, I definitely agree in my dynasty leagues where i have harris i have been a little bit aggressive bringing in Warren because I do think that's one of those valuable handcuff situations. Do you think that? Well, let me just ask you it this way: Where does Jalen Warren fall though in your handcuff kind of ranks? Oh, I mean, he's high for sure. Right. Like, I, yeah, I do yeah, think yeah. I think he's a good player. I just think yeah. like we shouldn't base that on uh, just a small sample size and assume that we can project it to him in a much bigger role and it's going to be the same. And. Um, so, yeah, I, but still, man, if anything happened to Najee, he'd be hugely valuable. And I guess right. the one thing that you can um, build your Jalen Warren case on, I, I guess the Steelers running backs coach is now going to, before I guess it was like Tom Leonard, the offensive coordinator, making the call about which running back was in the game for mm-hmm. a particular instance. And now it's the Steelers running backs coach who apparently is a big Jalen Warren advocate, but like, I don't think he likes Jalen Warren more than Najee Harris, I'm guessing. So, I, I, yeah, it's just hard to see a major shake up there. But I do think Jalen Warren is pretty valuable. I mean, I'm generally not a handcuff in August or September guy. I tend to wait until November. But then again, Jalen Warren's getting drafted in every draft. So yes. if you want him as a handcuff, you probably do have to do it in your draft. Jalen Warren is also your perfect zero RB build type running back to grab yeah. around pick 130 or so, 125. Uh, because, yes, if there's something were to happen to Najee, but I'm with you. I'm buying the dip. I suggest that everyone here tuning into the game plan also buys the dip on Najee Harris if you can. You know, this guy's 25 years old. He's at two years in the NFL, and both of those years he's gone for 1,000 yards rushing. He did have a dip in the passing game last year, but you also have to remember that, you know, they transitioned to their rookie, uh, you know, kind of beginning midway point of the season from Mitch to Kenny Pickett. It's now Kenny Pickett's team. It's going to be his weapons that he's going to have the full off season and then all this time to work with. And Najee, like I said, the first round draft pick kid who's done it in the past. Give me Najee Harris. I'm buying the dip all day. Jalen Warren. I, I think he has his place. He definitely will have his place in fantasy, but it's really not going to be, uh, a super lucrative unless there's an injury to Najee Harris. So I think I'm with you. Uh, I don't think it's a split. I see this as a strict starter handcuff type of situation for, for me. But it's a very, very valuable handcuff, so I, I'll give it to Jalen Warren. The last thing I want to talk to you about, it's a running back and quarterback dynamic that everyone is going to be thinking about. Everyone should be you know, thinking about how this affects the one affects the other. So how will Anthony Richardson, the for, the fourth pick in this year's NFL draft, how is he going to affect JT, Jonathan Taylor? Oh, man. Um, I can't wait to see how this plays out, Matty. Because, like, on, on one hand, we know that mobile quarterbacks tend to spike the efficiency of running backs they mm-hmm. play with. And, you know, because uh, – mainly because of the RPO thing, where if, if right. you're running RPO stuff and um, – at that mesh point, the defense 
sort of it it freezes them because they don't know whether the quarterback's keeping the ball or giving it to the running back. And man, when you've got Richardson and Jonathan Taylor, two big dudes who can absolutely fly, like that indecision is going to be like, I mean, that will stop some linebackers in their tracks and give those guys like, you know, an extra split second to, to burst through a hole or something. So um, that's going to be really interesting at the same time, though, Maddie. Like, I think Jonathan Taylor is probably going to see uh, consistently heavy boxes just because like opponents aren't really going to respect Anthony Richardson's ability to beat them downfield as a passer mm. until he shows it. I mean, maybe he can like, you know, nuke defenses with some long completions right away and, and change that. But I think at first uh, Taylor is going to see some of the heaviest boxes in the league. So that's kind of an interesting tug of war, man. But like, I mean, we saw when RG three came into the league, Alfred Morris who was like the definition of a plotter that guy averaged like 5.6 yards per carry or something like that in uh rg 3s rookie year so what's jonathan taylor going to do a guy who's actually explosive like i'm i'm really excited okay. to see that and the thing is i don't think we're going to get any inkling in the preseason what that's going to look like cuz defenses tend to play vanilla i don't think indy's going to want to show their their best rpo stuff in the preseason um but yeah, man, I, I cannot wait to see what that offense looks like in week one. RG3, Alfred Morris, first thing that comes to mind, Lamar Jackson and his ability to get, you know, your Gus Edwards of uh, valuable. Obviously, J.K. Dobbins is a lot more talented, but there have been a number of plotters that have succeeded with Baltimore. We talk about Kenyon Drake. Kenyon Drake was okay <laughs> yes, running alongside yes. Lamar Jackson. So there's that possibility. But you bring up one thing that I want to kind of dive into a little bit more, and that's the stack boxes. Jonathan Taylor has never had to face that in 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 the, in the Colts uniform. Last year, in his limited sample size, you know his the stack box rate was forty second. He did not see a lot of stack boxes the year before that, where he destroyed. Uh, he was again uh, outside of the top thirty in terms of the stack box rate. He was not a guy that had to see a lot of defenders right in his face. I I'm not worried. I think he's super talented, so I'm not worried that this is going to be effective. I just wonder though. Is it enough to that? Is is the stack box going to change his game enough where he's not the running back three, running back four, but we're talking about like six, seven, eight? That's kind of where I'm going to get in the weeds here. So let me ask you this: Can Taylor return his value going at you know twelfth off the board right now? His ADP is twelve point four. Oh, I think he definitely can, Maddie. I mean, I like this is still a dude who scored thirty two touchdowns in his first thirty two NFL games, a touchdown a game over two full seasons, and uh, you know led the league in rushing in twenty twenty one, averaged one hundred and twenty seven point seven yards from scrimmage mm -hmm. uh, that season. And you know last year he just he wasn't right, man. That high ankle sprain just uh, like he came back from it too early, wasn't himself. Um, so like there just weren't that many games where he was playing and healthy last year right, and right. you know and then he was kind of handicapped by the whole matt ryan thing just not working and and the colts offensive line like inexplicably just falling apart so um there there were some definite circumstances that led to that thing and you are right maddie that he has not had to face a lot of stack boxes uh with the colts but man as a Wisconsin fan i can tell you he saw a lot of heavy boxes when he was in Great madison point. for yes, three years yes. and still put up crazy numbers man mm -hmm. so like um you know his his footwork is just so good and that's the thing i think like maybe people don't realize about taylor like yes big fast but man his feet are like there can't be more than two or three running backs in the league with better feet than jonathan taylor and, he's um, special yeah that and like that helps so much when he's in traffic mm -hmm. but um you know so but there is going to be a push pull between that the heavy box thing and the Anthony Richardson RPO thing. So like I right. I, I just right. want to like I, point. I'm leaning towards the Anthony Richardson factor, like being a little outweighing the heavy mm -hmm. box factor, just a little. But um man, I just like I can't wait to see what it looks like because I just you know, I, I have ideas about what it might look like, but until you actually see it, you're not gonna know for sure. Uh, are you worried that Anthony Richardson can take a number of touchdowns away in terms of the goal line stuff? Could happen. Could happen. 
but like Taylor's also a dude who can score from anywhere on the field. I mean, this Bingo. guy has track Bingo. speed. Like as big as he is, he is a track athlete. And right. he can, you know, I don't know how many times I saw him house one from 50 plus yards at Wisconsin. I mean, it seemed like he was doing it every week. No, that that's the, the right answer. Because if we were talking about Jamal Williams, who had 17 one yard touchdown, right, runs, right, we might, we might be feeling like the Anthony Richardson, who's, you know, one of the most athletic quarterbacks we've ever seen would take away. But he's not for all the touchdowns that he takes with the one. Jonathan Taylor can earn plenty from rushing from the 14, from the opposite 14. You know, Jonathan Taylor's uber, uber talented. And so I think I know your answer here, but for the folks listening, are you buying or selling JT in Dynasty? Oh, I'm buying, definitely. And, uh, you know, like, not that he has gotten really cheap in Dynasty, but this is probably the most affordable he'll be mm -hmm. for quite a while until, yes. like, you know, we start to get concerned about the age curve. But right, right. now, I mean, like, Last year, you weren't trading for Jonathan Taylor in Dynasty. It just wasn't something you he wasn't achieve. available. Oh yeah. yeah, like his his uh, the people who had him are just clinging on to him like uh, you know <laughs> a life preserver in the middle of the ocean. And um, this year, you know, they might actually be willing to entertain offers. Yeah, uh, right. Sometimes, and I don't know what it is, Pat. Maybe you can help me out here. In the off season, running backs as a whole, we all just become the NFL, and we all just start going like, "Ah, give me the receiver, give me the receiver. I'd rather receiver." Right. But then when the bullets are flying in fantasy, we are all just we're all soldier crawling into the bear. We're all in the trenches, like, "Give me a running back! I need a running back! I'll take anything." We just need him. And if you can get a guy like Jonathan Taylor, I mean, this is the guy I think that can withstand some of the test of time. I don't think this guy. I mean, barring injury, of course, it's football. But, I mean, we're talking about a guy who's 230 pounds at 5'10", his BMI 32.4. I mean, this guy is a brick. He is a beast. He's a tank. I think he could age well for yeah. that. So I, I so I, I had a little nervousness, Pat. I, it was a little bit of a, a reluctancy to go after Jonathan Taylor. You have alleviated all that pressure. You have – ah, you've brought me some Jonathan Taylor relief, and I'm very, very happy for that. I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> because now I can go and tack the, 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 the shares where I feel like he's available with a little bit more aggression because – Okay, that's true. I want to see Anthony Richardson and Jonathan Taylor. I like, okay, thanks, Pat. I really Good appreciate man. it. And, and you make a great point, Maddie, by the way, about the, the way people – this time of year we tend to divorce ourselves from the week-to-week -week realities of a managed fantasy football team. Yes. And it's like the more you can – think about that and and like you know your willingness to actually put a guy in your starting lineup mm -hmm. and um you know like what your lineup is going to look like and oh wait i do need to start two running backs every week yeah um, you yeah. know it's great that this you know i have such uh firepower with my fifth and sixth receivers who i can't start this week because <laughs> you know i can only flex one spot um yeah man so it, the better we keep the actual season in mind um you know it's it's that's a good thing to practice when you're drafting i think yeah remember the chaos i mean i can't tell you how many times this this season pat i've been made fun of for my uh not excitement but i would say slight excitement for De like a guy like devin singletary and they're like why do you care about singletary was, he's been a 10 point a game running back for his whole career and like who cares that's like running back 30 on the year i'm like yeah, but every week I would love to make sure that I had one running back give me 10 points a game. I love, you know, sometimes when we're all in the, like I said, in the trenches, in the chaos, the bullets are flying and we're starting bad running backs. So let's face it, we're all going to be starting some bad running backs at some point. You got to get these guys in your team. They, they can help you win. That You win with the running back play. You know, that's just the stone hard facts. It's one of those tried and true things where we, we've gone through so many strategies over the years. We've heard about zero RB, late round quarterback, hero RB, anchor RB. There's all these strategies. But what rings true, you need those running backs to win, Pat. And Pat, you are an absolute winner. Thank you for joining me on the game plan. This was a blast. Uh, I'm super excited. Like I said, I've been a fan of yours, following your rankings for so long. So to be able to sit down and chat with you is honestly, I could check this off of my bucket list of content creation. This is a great, great, great moment for me. So thank you so much for joining the game plan. Uh, the floor is yours. Let everybody know where they can find you if they don't already, which would be crazy. But the floor is yours. Anything you want to promote and all that good stuff. 
Oh, wow. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, really appreciate you having me. And this was a blast, man. I had a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, Player Profiler, you guys put out so many good podcasts. Like, I'm, I'm a regular listener to uh, these shows. And, um, you know, it's just an honor to be on. So, um, yeah, we've we've got a lot cooking at Fantasy Pros, whether you are a best ball, redraft, dynasty player, doesn't matter. I mean, we're throwing out, like, multiple articles every day. And uh, a lot of great contributors. So, uh, you know, we also have the Fantasy Pros flagship podcast, which is soon going to be, boy, I think like five episodes a week, four episodes a week, plus the Fantasy Pros Dynasty podcast, which I host once a week with Scott Bogman. And uh, people can find me on Twitter at Fitz underscore FF. Very, very good. That's going to be a wrap on the game plan this week. Go ahead and like this video. Subscribe to the Player Profile YouTube channel. Go check us out on TikTok at Player Profile and Profile underscore NFL. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Matty Kiwum. The world famous draft kit is here. So keep game planning, my friends, and I'll talk to you next week. Peace.